Acts, and he asked me a, a really direct question. He said, Mike, I've got to ask you a question. I've asked some of you this question. But he said, if Jesus came back tonight, do you know for a fact that you would go to heaven? And I looked him in the eye and I said, I don't know that for a fact. I'm not sure. And he said, you know what you need to do in order to be sure. I said, yeah, I need to give my life to Christ. He goes, right. And you can do that tonight. And I said, well, there's a ball game tonight. <laughs> Sound like some of you. Always something, you know, that's more important than eternity. <laughs> so I said, well, there's a ball game tonight because in our town, that was if you cut our heads open, little basketballs would come out. And everybody, there's anybody, went to a basketball game. That was the first game of the year. And it was the first year that I was not playing, ironically. So I said, well, I could, but there's a basketball game tonight. And then he said to me, you know, there will be a lot of basketball games. This is your, this could be your night to give your life to Christ. Man, his logic's impeccable. And I said, okay. And so I did. And so that night at the revival, I, I told him, I said, I don't remember a word you said that night at the sermon. I don't remember a word you said. Uh, but I remember when the, when the night, when the decision came, that I came forward, I professed my faith in Jesus, and they baptized me into Christ, and you know the rest of the story. So I'm going to offer that to you, because this ain't a game. This is not just a, we don't get a mulligan. Um, if you don't know for sure that you're going to heaven, um, this is your chance to do something about that. So at the end of the sermon today, we're going to issue an invitation. The musicians are going to come up, and, and they're going to play a song, and we're going to stand, and we're going to sing, and that's your chance to come forward and say, I want to begin to follow Jesus. I want to make him the Lord of my life, and I want to confess that before people, and I want to join him in a life of doing the will of God. And if you've, and then we'll, we'll, and we'll do what they did in the Bible. We'll baptize you into Christ right then and there. Water's 92, right? Mm. So uh, that's your, this is your chance. Or if you said, I've already been baptized, but everybody's my church home. We'll give you, you can come and make this your church home. We're pretty nice people here. And that's that. So, all right. Let's get into the Word, can we? All right. I got a couple of scriptures for you that I believe will just bless your heart. The title of the sermon this morning is called The Goodness of God. And we're doing this series on Celebrate Him. And as Scott said a while ago, you know, there's only two things that, were really, that, that we celebrate more than Jesus' birth, and that's His death and His resurrection. But today we're going to talk about the goodness of God of God that was manifested in the person of Jesus by the life that he lived. So would you stand with me to take a look at a couple passages of Scripture. One is background, and the second one we're going to focus on it later on. John chapter 3. I think you've heard this one before. For God, you say it with me if you want, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I like this. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Remember I said a couple weeks ago, I said God is not against us for our sins. He's for us against our sins. John chapter 8, 1 through 11. So, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again to the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down and he taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. 
And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? And this they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. So Jesus bent down, and he wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and he said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And then Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go from now on and sin no more. Father, help us to see and experience something this morning of your goodness and power, your mercy and kindness, your authority, yet your tenderness that was manifested through your Son. Help us, Lord, to see and appreciate and experience Jesus all over again. In his name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Loved you guys doing the Christmas carols this morning. Loved the guitar trio up here. It was great. That was love that. Huh? You guys did good. As you notice, if you've been visiting, we do we do some modern songs and we do some traditional songs. Um, the reason we do both is because they both have earned the right to be sung. The new songs, we need those new songs, that fresh wind, fresh fire, because the Holy Spirit didn't quit inspiring songs in 1958. At the same time, let me tighten this a little. At the same time, some of those older songs have earned the right to be sung, and so we do. And we got the musicians, we could rock it out if we wanted to. We could give you a full-blown concert, full-blown rock concert. We got the musicianship for it, but we're really playing to another tune. And we're playing to whatever is uh, meaningful and good to minister to people and lift up the name of Jesus. So, Doug, appreciate the work you're doing, you and your team, and uh, in leading us in worship. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. The old familiar carols play. Wild and sweet, the words repeat. Peace on earth. Goodwill to men. Not to men, or uh, to men, not from men. Goodwill to men. Paul said it this way, all this is from God, who is reconciling the world to himself through Christ, not counting men's sins against them. You know, no one, except maybe the Pharisees and the scribes, no one would dispute the fact that Jesus was kind. Who would dispute that? But these people, the Pharisees and the scribes, are the type of people that always called bad things good and called good things bad. And so Jesus is going around healing people and, and people are being blessed by that and just marveling and giving God the praise and the glory and the Pharisees are going over and saying, <gasps> You did that on a Sabbath. Uh, yeah. And they're always bothered about the fact that he might have done some of these on the Sabbath of all times. Like, you can't love people on the Sabbath. God can't do anything good on the Sabbath. But you talk to the people who he ministered to, and you hear a completely, entirely different story. 
ask Lazarus, who Jesus raised from the dead. He would tell you, he's a pretty good guy. <laughs> I was dead. And, that, and he, he came four days later, and my sister said it was four days, and he raised me from the dead. He's a pretty good guy. I don't know if we can appreciate what's going on until we talk about this matter of the law. This sounds kind of technical and religious and all that, but I don't think we can appreciate the goodness of God that was manifested through Jesus unless we can have some type of understanding or appreciation for the climate and environment in which these people lived. They lived and died under the law. Jesus lived and died under the law. The law was very specific. You shall do this. You shall not do that. You shall do this. You should not do that. It nails its target every time. It's like when you go to the doctor's office and you get on the scales. I say, oh, do we have to do that again? Can we just skip that little step, you know? So I take off my shoes and I take my wallet out and I take my keys out and, you know, I want to make it an equal playing field if we possibly can. But the scales, the scales are specific. They, they hit the target every time. They do not lie. Or the motion sensor that's outside your house or somebody's house. You moved, whoop, the lights come on. It's inescapable. There's no way around it. And that's sort of what was going on with this matter of, of the law. The sacrifices. You see it, first of all, in the sacrifices. They had to do all these sacrifices. And there was no way around them. There was no way out of them. There was no way getting out of the law and these sacrifices that had to be there. We're going to Jerusalem again. Yes, son, you know, we're going to Jerusalem again. We go to Jerusalem every year at this time to do the sacrifices. Yes, I know, Father, we got to go. And so every family of anybody rolls up their, their little tent and they move to Jerusalem for a few days and they do the sacrifices. Every year, every year, same thing. No exceptions, no deposit, no return, and no assurances. The scriptures tell us that the sacrifices really never could make one right with God. They simply rolled back sin. This is what they labored under. And the commands, the commands of the, of the law are very specific. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covenant. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The commandments are very specific. i got to ask you a question. Who keeps the commandments? Nobody. Except Jesus. And you know that. And the scriptures say that if we break one commandment of the law, that we have broken all of them because they all stand or fall as a unit. They're very precise. And then you add to that the oral tradition that the scribes and the Pharisees had heaped on the people with all these books and codes and laws and this and that, application and implication and explanation of the law itself. And you add all this, this, this oral tradition, huge volumes of stuff, and you put that out there for people and say, you got to do all this. It's a burden. It's a burden that no one could carry. It's a terrible burden. Oppressive. Unyielding. No hope. Week after week after week after year. No hope. No way out. This was, this was what they were laboring under and living under that dark shadow. And then a voice. Not only a voice, but a presence. Not John the Baptist's voice, 
John the Baptist's voice was new and different, and that sure shook him up and sure got their attention. But this was a voice that was a little bit, this was something new, something refreshing, something that was unheard of before. Something, this was a, something powerful and yet kind. It was new, it was fresh, it was different. C.S. Lewis captured this really well in his book, The Chronicles of Narnia. In the, in the Jesus figure, represented by Aslan the lion. And Aslan the lion, you ought to read it. Put down Harry Potter and all that nonsense and read some good stuff. Uh, it, the, as, the Aslan the Jesus figure was a rare combination of strength and goodness. That rare combination of power and kindness. Strength and goodness. And his coming, you can sense it as you read. I said, Lewis does a great job of this. You sense it that Aslan is on the move, and he brings his presence brings a hope to the world. So this voice, this voice is different. This voice is different, and this voice is new, but there's something about it that rings true. And so what Jesus said, what Jesus said, let's just say that in his words, that the power and the kindness of God is unmistakable in what he said and who he said it to. I'm going to say it again. It's on screen already. But the power and the kindness of Jesus is unmistakable in what he said and to who he said it to. He tells them at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, you know, or in other places, you've heard this and you've heard that, you've heard this and that, but I say this to you. And you sense as you're listening to him speak that this is something beyond all the platitudes and the, the drudgeries and the regurgitating rules and that that the Pharisees and the scribes had constantly barraged these people with. Oh, no. They're going to tell us about Daniel and the lion's den one more time. Okay, go ahead. Wait me when it's over. It's a great story, but you're going to tell it again. All right. No, not this time. This time, the Bible says that they marveled at his teaching. They marveled at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority and not like the scribes and the Pharisees. You guys put that net on the other side of the boat and you'll catch more fish than what you know to do with. Oh, but we fished all night and we didn't catch anything. You just put your net on the other side. You think we hadn't thought about putting our net on the other side of the boat right before this time? We're professional fishermen. Just put your net on the other side of the boat. They'd fished all night. And it took in such a large catch of fish. They couldn't believe it. It was beginning to break the nets. His authority, and yet his kindness. She's only sleeping. A little girl had died. They told Jesus about it. He went to her parents' house where she, the little girl was lying and stayed in the back room, and friends and family were there in the front room, and Jesus said, what are you crying about? She's only sleeping. And they laughed at him. They laughed at him. He said, she's dead. You know she's dead. What do you mean she's sleeping? He took his inner circle and he went to the back room where the little girl was. And he said to her, little girl, wake up. And she woke up. 
by the hand. Give her to her parents. He said, now give her something to eat. <laughs> they were amazed as words. Power. Yet kindness. The centurion's servant was ill and near the point of death. And he came to Jesus out on the trail. And he said that his servant was near death. And he said, I'm under authority. And so I know what happens. You just say, you just say the word. You just say the word. You don't have to come to my house. I'm not worthy. You don't have to come to my house. Just say the word. And I believe that she'll be okay if you just say the word. Jesus said, okay. Let it be as you wish. And the centurion went home, and then they, so they said that the time of hour in which she, began, she heal, was healed was the very hour in which Jesus met him on that road. The power and the kindness of God. And then that paralytic was lowered. That one day Jesus was teaching, going about his business, and these guys got a little desperate with a friend who was paralyzed and they dropped him through the roof on a pallet into the middle of all that was going on. And Jesus looks at this guy and he says, young man, I want to tell you something. Your sins are forgiven. Pharisees were present in the room and some of them were thinking, what's going on with them? And Jesus said, I know what you're thinking. I know exactly what you're thinking. Because they were questioning who is this who claims to have the authority to forgive sin? He said, I know what you're thinking. What is easier for me to say? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, arise, take up your mat, and walk. And he turns to the young man, and he looks at him, and he says, young man, take up your mat and walk. And he got up. And he left. Ah, the power and the kindness of God. Even to, even to Nicodemus, who Jesus gave some challenging words. Nicodemus was a, a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin. And he came to Jesus at night, wanted to know some things about him. And, and Jesus kind of didn't, Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't cut him any slack. Jesus said, uh, <clears throat> he, goes, he goes, now look, Nick. You've got to be born again. You must be born again. And so they had a discussion about that. He said, what Jesus is essentially saying is, I don't, look, you might have a degree, you say the same thing to anybody. You might have a degree in theology. You might be able to recite the catechism in backwards. You might be able to do the rosary in 12 languages. You might have a King James Version Bible the size of Vermont. But you must be born again. Power and the kindness of God. And this is why so many Christians, this is why so many people are not Christians. They have never heard his voice. And if you're one of those, here's what I want to challenge you to do, is to read the Gospels. Listen to the words of Jesus. Hear the words of the Master in his own voice. Let him speak his words to you. So Jill was wandering through the woods. She had gotten away from the rest of the group. She was alone. And as she wandered through the day, she became incredibly thirsty. There was no water. And then she began, she thought she heard in the distance the sound of running water. So she walked in that direction and she came to a clearing in the woods and there was this beautiful, clear 
stream of water flowing just a few yards from her. <gasps> but between her and that stream of water was a large, large lion. He looked at her and he said, Are you thirsty? She said, I'm dying of thirst. And he said, well, come and drink. And she started to, and she saw him, and she said, do you eat little girls? Oh, he said, I eat little girls and little boys, moms and dads, kingdoms and nations. He wasn't angry. He just said it. She said, what if I don't come and drink? He said, then you will die. And so, she gradually moved in the direction of the water. And she got closer and closer and closer and finally came close to the lion. She realized something. His mane was soft. His breath was sweet. And his eyes were kind. And she kneeled over to the water. And she drank. The power and the kindness of God is not only seen in the things that Jesus said, but it's also his goodness goes beyond words and is on display in what he did. The Gadarene demoniac, crazy, ran around in his birthday suit, frightening little old ladies and scaring people, and they can't, they can't apprehend him. He put chains on him, he broke the chains, and he was going through cemeteries in town, and he's just crazy, out of his mind, possessed. He came to Jesus. Jesus cast the demon out of him. An amazing thing is that the townspeople came out to see what was going on. And when they got there, they saw this man clothed, seated at the feet of Jesus, quote, in his right mind. The goodness and the power of God. I don't know who he is. I didn't get his ID. But I do know this, that once I was blind, and now I can see. I didn't mean for that to be a poem, by the way, but it sure has potential. But this young man was not intimidated by the Pharisees as his parents were. His parents were afraid if they said, well, I think Jesus did it. They were afraid that they would be cast out of the synagogue. But this young man was not intimidated by the Pharisees because he had personally experienced the goodness and the power of God. Jesus turns to the disciples and he said, this crowd, this large crowd, 5,000 men plus, this large crowd has been following us for days. Let's give them something to eat. And the disciples said, well, all, all we got is a few loaves and fishes. And Jesus said, that's enough. And you know the rest of the story. And they had the biggest fish fry in the history of the world. Ah, the goodness and the power of God. And then there was Lazarus. I mentioned him, didn't I? I did. He was Jesus' friend. He and his sisters Mary and Martha to live just a few miles from Jerusalem. Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, and he said to the disciples, let's go wake him up. They thought that Jesus meant that he was asleep, but Jesus meant that he had died. Lazarus was dead. And so they arrived outside of Bethany, just a couple of 
two or three days later. Lazarus had been dead four days when they got there. Martha met him first. Then she went back to the house and Jesus went toward the tomb and Mary came with some friends who were weeping and crying and they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep over her brother and so they came with her and and not only was Mary weeping but her friends were weeping and they were all worked up and they were sorrowful and sharing in her sorrow and the Bible says that Jesus looked at this group and it said the shortest verse in all the Bible Jesus wept Ah, he really loved those people he really loved those people And he goes to the tomb of Lazarus. And he stands outside the tomb. And he says in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. He said, now roll away the stone. Roll away the stone. Out walked Lazarus, still wrapped in the burial cloths. And Jesus says, go unwrap him. the goodness, and the power of God. And all of this took place under that dark shadow of the law. It was so, it was so frustrating. There was obligation, 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 but no hope. There was expectation, do more, do more, do more, but no relief. Go to Sabbath, go to Sabbath, go to Sabbath, go to Sabbath, but never any Sabbath rest. And then Jesus came, and there was fresh wind and fresh fire. This woman who was caught in adultery, his goodness and power gave hope to a woman who otherwise had none. This woman had been caught in adultery and they brought her to Jesus. Now the law is very specific in what it says. It said that a person who was caught in adultery should be stoned. And so they brought this woman to Jesus. Now, where was the man? Oh, they didn't bring him. Should have brought him too. Their hypocrisy knows no limits. And so they try to trap Jesus And they asked him, they said, the law, Moses said that this person should be stoned. What do you say we should do to her? Try to trap him. Jesus gets down and he begins to write in the sand. Just began to write. And they're accusing her and bringing this to him. And he just didn't say, he just began to write in the sand. Okay, he's right-handed. Okay. I don't know. What was he writing? Then he stood and he said, those of you who are without sin, cast the first stone. And he sat down and he kept writing. And one by one, all of her accusers left. What was he writing? I don't know. I believe he was writing the commandments, the law. And they realized, because he said, he who is without sin cast the first stone. They all left. And he stood up. And he said to the woman, where are your accusers? They said, She said, they're gone. I don't know where they went. They're gone. And then he said these marvelous words. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and stop sinning. Ah, the goodness and the power of God. Do you hear those words? Do you hear those words yourself. The words that he said, neither do I condemn you. Go 
and stop sinning. The goodness and the power of God is still alive. It's still available and it's still at work. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does He sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, good will to men. Father, May your goodness and power and kindness come through in a great way this Christmas season. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand and sing. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow he washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. It's a great privilege and a great honor as this young lady comes up here nervously, but bold in her faith, and takes it seriously and she's been wanting to get baptized for a while and we've talked about it we took a recess a couple times and then we got together Wednesday and her gift to the Lord this year is to give her life to him Amen. so yeah <laughs> with that being said she wants to say before her church family I believe I believe that Jesus is the Christ that Jesus is the Christ son of the living God the Son of the Living God, and I take Him, and I take Him as my Lord and my Savior, as my Lord and my Savior. And God's people said, Amen. Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness watch and pray, find in me thine all in all, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow, Jesus paid. Jesus paid it all, all 
to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow.